All right, guys. So, uh, so I'm Nikki, and you got the introduction. I've been a, a parks and recreation professional since 1967. I started my career on the playgrounds of East Los Angeles, and then, uh, and then went all those places. And uh, it's in the process of. Uh, and I've never had a job for longer than seven years, so I've changed around a lot. I, I want to say before we get started that there are three jobs that I had in the city of Seattle that have sort of informed or has give, have given me sort of a unique view. Um, you know, I also, also taught for 30 years and so I have the academic experience and I have the practitioner experience, but there were three jobs in the city of Seattle and I feel like I need to share those with you because that's really what has give, given me a fairly unique perspective about uh, organizational change and equity and that kind of thing. Uh, the mayor of Seattle in 1993 asked me to, uh, to be the director of innovation for the city of Seattle. And, uh, and I said, I, I don't know what a director of innovation does. And he says, I don't quite know what a director of innovation does either. But uh, I don't believe that there's any such thing as the status quo. I believe that my organization is either changing with my participation or without my participation. And I wanna be consciously uh, in charge of the evolution of the organization. And, uh, and then he said, you know, I got three ways I can describe it to you, two of which I think you'll like, the other one you won't. Uh, I want you to be an organizational irritant. I want you to go around and ask our 10,000 employees, how come we're still doing things the same way? Uh, but if you're gonna be an irritant, you gotta be a cheerleader. So you have, to, you have to be irritating from the standpoint of your love for the organization and wanting to make something better. Uh, and then he said, and the third one, the one you're not gonna like it, is I sort of want you to function as an organizational laxative. Uh, to which I say, and I'm thinking in my head, I'm thinking, do I need to be a, a suppository or can I be an oral laxative? You know, I'm kind of thinking about that in my head, but I said, what are you talking about? And he said, we have 10,000 employees and we only have 100 suggestions in our suggestion award system. I got to believe that every employee at least has one idea a year. And I think those ideas are somewhere and they're blocked up and I want you to find the blockage and I want you to release those ideas. Uh, and and because, because ideas are our currency. So uh, for three years, it was my job to focus the creative energy of 10,000 employees. And eventually we created an innovation system uh, for employees, any employee who could submit an idea, submitted that idea to me. Uh, and then we also did the same thing for residents. Uh, the next job, I got a call from the city council. I left that job, I got a call from the city council and the, and the council said, you know, Mickey, we're finding citizens increasingly irritating. And what's interesting about that job is the city of Raleigh has asked me to reimagine the entire community engagement process for the city of Raleigh, which is much like the work I did in Seattle uh, about, uh, about 20 years later. So I, I, I created a citizens university. Uh, we began to fight with the idea that community engagement is a democratic process but periodically it runs into political stuff and it's the political stuff that destroys it. And that is essentially what has happened in the city of Raleigh. They had these things called CACs, which was supposed to be a democratic process and, and community engagement, but they became very political. So they disbanded the CACs and we're now in the process of reimagining what community engagement is in the city of Raleigh. On December 2nd, 2002, and, and, and Ian mentioned this, uh, uh, I get a call from a different mayor who says the mayor wants you to consider a job. And now I know it's gonna be something weird. My family began to refer to me as the master of the ill-defined job. And uh, the mayor and the deputy mayor said to me, the mayor wants to end all forms of racism in the workforce uh, and in the city. And, uh, and so that's, that's what the job is. And I'm saying, that doesn't sound like a job to me. That sounds like, that sounds like some kind of sentence. Uh, but the mayor had been uh, campaigning and as he went around the city, he realized that different people in the city characterized the city differently. And a lot of that had to do with race and socioeconomic status. So the mayor asked me to create the architecture what, for what was essentially the first municipal recre, uh, the, the first municipal equity initiative in the country. 
Uh, I didn't have any idea what to do. I didn't have anybody to call. Uh, but, um, but, but we've pulled people together. We use the collective intelligence of the people in the workforce to try to pull that together. And now, because I'm saying that was 2002, so uh, it's been more than 20 years. It's been more than 20 years since we created um, that. So, uh, and then right after that, John Jarvis, who had worked at Mount Rainier, and I had worked with him with equity programs at Mount Rainier. He was trying to figure out why Black and Hispanic people uh, didn't go to Mount Rainier. And by the way, that's been a part of my work since 1970. When I graduated from college from Cal State Sacramento, the California State Parks Director, William Penn Mott, who eventually became Director of the National Park Service, asked me to find out why Black people didn't go to state and national parks. That was in 1970. And they're still trying to answer the same question today. And a part of the problem is that uh, is that they don't like the answer to the question, is that they think that they understand what the answer to the question is, but they really don't. So when John Jarvis became director of the National Park Service, he invited me to be the deputy director of the National Park Service. Um, I called in to congratulate him, to say, attaboy, John, I'm really proud of you. I, I think you're going to do a great job. And I said, if there's anything you want me to do for you, let me know. And he said, well, I would like you to consider disrupting your life and coming back to DC and being deputy director of the National Park Service, to which I responded, no, I had no interest in that. I'm thinking I got a job in Seattle where I can go home and take a nap. My son was playing basketball at the University of Oregon and I could get to all of his basketball games. Plus I had decided that there was no intelligent life east of I-5 and that there was never any reason for me to ever, I, I grew up on the East Coast and in the South, and I didn't think there was any reason for me to ever go back. But, uh, but I did, I did it for three and a half years. Uh, John said the reason he wanted me as opposed to a more traditional manager was because of all that crazy stuff I had done, because of innovation work, because of the community engagement work, because of the youth development work. Uh, so, so I did that for three and a half years. Uh, introducing the concept of relevancy, diversity, and inclusion to the National Park Service. The National Park Service is the most segregated organization in the federal government. Uh, its, its workforce should be 67% uh, white, it's 90% white. Its seasonal workforce is 90% white. Its, uh, its visitors are 90% white. And, 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 and John came in and, 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 and said, I, I don't think I can um, accept that. I think that we need to do something to change that. So, um, so I did that work uh, for three and a half years. I decided I was getting older and uh, it was probably time for me to slow down a little bit. Um, so I elected not to stay for the second term. I sent out a missive to a number of people in the parks and recreation profession that I was leaving and, um, and I heard from the East Bay Regional Park District I heard from Texas A&M University and I heard from North Carolina State University. Mary Watson invited me down to be what's called a professor of practice. And so um, I did that for seven years. I, ta I taught my last course last semester. So that's kind of the career in a nutshell. What I thought uh, you might want to talk about today is this whole issue about the importance of place. And so I've titled this, The Importance of Your Ecosystem. Uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna kind of migrate, it's gonna kind of wander. Uh, it, it, you know, there may be some things that I talk about that I don't clarify exactly right, but I, I thought I would take this hour to illustrate to you some things about the complexity of this issue. So uh, the, the importance of your ecosystem. Uh-oh, now you see. All right. I don't know how many of you uh, have seen a film called The Biggest Little Farm. Uh, the Biggest Little Farm is a film, is a documentary film, which has literally changed my life. I have, um, uh, I've seen it over five or six times. I own it. I have bought it for people, but it was about a couple who were living in Los Angeles and their dog could not be an urban dog. So they decided they needed to move out to the country um, uh, uh, so that their dog would have a place to live. And they decided that they were gonna create the ultimate ecosystem. 
that they were going to create the ultimate farm. Uh, and they hired somebody who said, well, uh, in order for nature to stay in balance, there are five things uh, that need to be present. And those five things, the first thing is diversity. If you don't have diversity, it's impossible to have balance. The problem is diversity creates problems. The more diversity you've got, the more challenges you've got, but the more diversity you have, the more resilient your ecosystem. And I think one of the things that, uh, that America hasn't grappled with is the fact that diversity is its number one competitive advantage. Diversity is its asset. But what's happening in American society is people are afraid of the diversity and they're sorting themselves. They are, uh, they're sorting themselves and they're living around people who think what they think and believe what they believe. So, um, so but diversity is important. And then he says, but also what's important in these systems is order. If you have diversity, diversity also requires order. And order has to do with knowing that the sun is going to come up and knowing that there are going to be seasons and, um, and, 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 and knowing how these things affect each other. So, uh, so the, the other part of the system is order. The other part of the system is randomness that natural systems are random, that stuff just happens. And I think that you can see by virtue of what's going on in American society right now, what that's all about. And then uh, there's also chaos, that stuff just happens, right? The randomness creates chaos, but the key to the ecosystem being healthy is its ability to adapt. So that adaptability becomes important. And adaptability isn't about reaction, it's about response. So I recently uh, had a conversation with the mayor of Raleigh about what happened after George Floyd. And I was saying to her, you know, the first uh, uh, riots that occurred precipitated by police activity happened in Watts in 1965. And, uh, and so what happened was there's a police action and every time this has happened, exactly the same thing happened. There's a police action. Uh, uh, people come out that day, they make a cathartic response to that police action. And there are always people who come out to exploit that action. But the people who come out to exploit the action are always gone by the second or third day. So this has happened in Los Angeles. This has happened in Detroit. This has happened in New York. This has happened in the, the first reaction is a cathartic reaction to the problem, but not the appropriate response. And so what you're gonna see is that we obviously haven't made the right response. We obviously haven't made the right response because we're still having the same problem. So we have George Floyd, people come out the first night, they break windows and they loot. And then the serious people come out and demonstrate. But the question is, a lot of thought goes into uh, 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 not reacting to things, but making considered responses to things. So in this film, and I hope you will all look at it, and, 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 and the ecosystems require the, those things on the right side that's called acoustics. Uh, but in the film, uh, they started raising chickens and they had these wonderful chickens that were laying these wonderful eggs. And, uh, and all of a sudden, coyotes showed up out of nowhere and started eating the chickens, uh, which was not only a financial problem for them, but, but, um, but also kind of a family problem. So now they've got to decide how they're going to control the coyotes. A reaction is to go out and shoot the coyotes because the coyotes are creating a problem for you. And if you watch the movie, you'll see that they did shoot a coyote and then they were very, very remorseful because what they found out is that they kill the coyotes, then there's nothing to kill the gophers. And this whole thing is about the diversity of the interaction of ecosystems and that, 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 that requires diversity, order, randomness, chaos, and adaptability 
and our society hasn't been real good at the adaptability part. They've been good at making cathartic reactions. They've been good at dealing with what's called referral pain. Referral of pain is where you treat a problem uh, at, the, at the symptom where the problem manifests itself, but not necessarily the root of the problem. So these are the requirements of all ecosystems. Uh, this is happening in East Raleigh, right? I mean, um, you cannot have an ecosystem and ecosystem cannot be in balance unless it includes these things. All right. Okay, uh, the importance of your space. What is the importance of your space to who you are and you become? And, uh, and, and your success and who you become is inextricably linked to the space or the ecosystem in which you develop. In which you develop. Uh, your, your ecosystem, the place where you live, defines what you see, what you hear, what you experience, what you eat, who you learn from, what you learn, the condition of your mind, body, and spirit. I live in East Raleigh. I live in a zip code 27610. And in that zip code, the lifespan is 13 years less than the lifespan in Briar Creek. You get that? 13 years less. Your, the ecosystem in which you live has a lot to do with the condition of your mind, body, spirit. It determines how you live in community. Uh, whether you're living in, com in, in, in community and you're, uh, and you're living, there are two kinds of genetic imprints as it relates to community. One genetic imprint is the rugged individualist where I'm gonna take care of me uh, and I don't care about nobody else. I'm just gonna take care of what I gotta take care of. And the other genetic imprint is kinship, which is the barn raising. And that means that we all take care of each other. And we see in American society right now this, this huge split between people who are selfish and defensive and territorial and want to take care of themselves and people who are coming to the aid of other people. It was really so uh, gratifying to see OAC raise $2 million for Texas, right? Because she has a sense of kinship. She has a sense, sense of empathy for those people. So um, the condition of your mind, body, and spirit, how you live in community, the manifestation of your genetic predisposition, what you value, your career, recreational, and vocational interests. Your career, recreational, and vocational interests are typically based on the things that you see in front of you on a daily basis. So that's another one of those things that your ecosystem and your space provides for you the ability to identify, refine, and share your gifts. So I'm going to tell a little drifting story here for a minute, but my wife and I just sold a house in Seattle, uh, luckily, and we were able to pay off our children's college debt. It was $170,000. And, um, and we calculated how much money we thought we invested in our children from the time they were born until the time they graduated from college. And we think it was probably something around $800,000. Imagine all of the young people in the city of Raleigh, especially in East Raleigh, who will never have parents who either have the inclination or the money to be able to do that. So when you look at juvenile hall in Raleigh, you find several things. You find a, disproport a disproportionate number of people of color you find people without fathers. Uh, you find people who are illiterate and people who have never had the opportunity to find their gift. They've never had an opportunity to find the reason they were put on the planet. In your ecosystem, it also gives you a connection to your cultural tribe. And your cultural tribe is the activity and the events around which you feel the most alive. My cultural tribes are, are Epicureans, I love good food and good wine, uh, and basketball. Those are my cultural tribes. And your ecosystem should provide you opportunities to interact with your cultural tribe because that's where you find that sense of kinship. Your awareness of the space as, as it helps you to form your value system about health and environment, about what's important to you. Uh, does that space contribute to you fulfilling 
your needs for independence. And we all have a need to be independent. We all have a need for mastery to be good at something. We all have a need for connection and kinship to love something and to have something love us. We all have a need to feel unique and special about who we are. And we all need power. And power is the ability to make something happen as a direct result of what you do. It is, I think, the most intoxicating thing on the planet. So, uh, so I, I, I used to invite people to my house before COVID. And I had this thing I wanted to do where I would give them something to eat or drink that was so good that they would involuntarily close their eyes. And, and it didn't always happen. I would always aspire to, it didn't always happen. Uh, but I found one little magical thing that I'll share with you. So I, you know, you're young people, I'm sure you consume tequila and, and, and the baseline tequila is some horrible stuff. It's horrible stuff, but good tequila is really good. Now, people had this thing about sucking on salt and lime and then drinking tequila. And I found a whole new way to drink tequila. And it is to get mango. It's got, you got to have good, good tequila. You get mango. You sprinkle cinnamon on the mango. You take a sip of the tequila. And you bite the mango. And you involuntarily close your eyes. That feeling of individuation and mastery, the feeling I get for, from that then makes me want to repeat it as often as possible. The problem is we can also get that sense of power. Um, we can look at uh, independence, mastery, connection, individuation, and power. And it's also what happens when you join a gang. So we have to provide opportunities. And this is what Parks and Rec Asian people have to start looking at to give people positive opportunities for independence, mastery, connection, individuation, and power. Because if we don't give them positive opportunities to do it, they don't not do it. They just gravitate to the dark side. And then uh, the last question in this slide is, does the ecosystem of the space you live in cause you to want to care for it, tolerate it, endure it or leave it. So what does that space that you live in do? Now I live in 27610, which is in East Raleigh, but I have the benefit of living in a place called Longview and I live on seven tenths of an acre and there are big trees and the dogs can run around and I wanna stay there. I've always believed that, you're, that the space that you live in both the home that you live in and the other space that you live in should uh, excite you when you're depressed and calm you down when you're anxious. So these are all the things we want ecosystems to do. This is when ecosystems are habitat. Now in the natural world, habitat exists for shelter, for procreation, for play, for water, and those kinds of things. But human beings need way more things in their ecosystems. They need all of these other things that we've just mentioned. Uh, so because I'm looking at my screen, I'm gonna stop for a minute and see if anybody uh, needs anything clarified to see if any, because I can't look at the chat room right now. So I just wanna check in before I go on to see if there's anything anybody uh, uh, needs to clarify, wants to discuss. So let me stop and, and see if, if anybody wants to, uh, to ask anything. Okay, so I'm not hearing anything. So I'm assuming we're good. All right, so what do we really know about the future? Um, and, and I've looked at this for a long time. I mean, I, I probably had this slide for years. And, uh, and it used to be that when we talked about the future, especially as parks and recreation people, we talked about labor saving devices and we talked about technology and we talked about how wonderful the world was gonna be. We were gonna have much more discretionary time. We were gonna have discretionary income. We were gonna be the Jetsons. We were gonna be flying. You know, some of you may not even know who the Jetsons were. So I have to be careful about doing that. Uh, but the Jetsons were the space age family that flew around and they had microwave ovens and all that kind of stuff, right? But 
Uh, and some of that stuff happened and some of that stuff didn't. Here's what I think we know about the future. The world will continue to shrink. There will only be increasing difference in diversity. There will be lots of change and uncertainty and economies will be unpredictable. So if we believe that that's the future that we're in store for, then what should we be doing to prepare for that future? Now, uh, as a recreation person, one of the things I understand about free time is people have always used their free time to practice the survival skills required for the time that they live in. The Olympics were nothing but practice for hunting and war, right? And so a question we need to ask ourselves is if we were gonna be practicing uh, to be successful with the kind of things that we're being confronted with now, what kinds of things would we be doing? Would we still be running, jumping and throwing? It's still true that in most cities, a huge amount of the recreation dollar goes to sports and athletics. When in fact, we've got problems with relationships, we've got problems with diversity, we've got problems with sustainability, we've got issues with all of those things, but we're still using discretionary time for amusement. And I wanna suggest that it can still be amusement, but we can approach these challenges. You can judge the quality of any society by examining four factors, the condition of their most vulnerable citizens, children, elderly, disabled, poor, and mentally ill, the condition of their environment, are their choices and lifestyles compatible with their environment? How safe are they? And we can determine the quality of civilizations by looking at how they use their discretionary time. And if you really look at how Americans use their discretionary time, Today, you'll see real similarities to what happened in Greece and Rome before they fell. Um, we have to ask a question. Do we spend more time watching than we spend participating? Do we spend more time consuming things than we spend getting involved in things? So if we had to look at these things and if we had to say, so what kind of condition is American society in? Uh, most people, when I ask this question, if you were a class, I would say, so how many people think we're doing a good job and nobody would raise their hand? But the reality is that it's always the best of times and the worst of times. That we're always doing some stuff that's really good and we're always doing some stuff that's really challenging. And what we have to understand about ecosystems and natural systems is that they're basically self-correcting systems that they swing in one direction and then they swing back. Now, there are some questions about whether we swung too far this time before the system started to correct itself, but the system will correct itself. But if we, if we go back to this slide about what do we really know about the future and to this slide about the quality of any civilizations, look at the implication of, look at the implications for parks and recreation agencies to address these things. All right, and what is it that we all need? I mentioned that we all need uh, um, um, independence, we all need mastery, we all need kinship, we all need individuation, we all need power. We also need to be connected with creativity for a lifetime. That creativity isn't making creative products, it's a way of approaching and living life. Uh, creativity is about living life as a journey into seeing and communicating the extraordinary things that happen in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So we need to be, we need lifelong creativity. We need consistent contact with nature. Uh, contact with nature is not, uh, uh, it's a basic human need. It's not a cultural amenity. It's not a recreation activity. It, 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 it's something we need to be mentally and physically healthy. Um, uh, it's something, the great thing about nature is there's this thing called sensory retrieval, uh, which is another part of what parks and recreation people need to be dealing with. Sensory retrieval is when you go someplace and all of your senses are woken. Your sense of smell, your sense of sight, uh, your hearing, 
your taste, all of those things, and nature does that. Uh, we mentioned before that we need love and kinship. The quality of our lives depend on our ability to maintain relationships with others. Um, and then we have to consider in American society, what's the psychic and fiscal cost of broken relationships? And this whole thing about America sorting into groups of people where you live with people who are just like you are and who reinforce your values are creating a situation where you have love and kinship for the people you're around, but not necessarily for people outside of your affinity group. And then um, the other thing we need is safety. Um, Tanya and I, my wife and I just went out to uh, Lake Johnson the other day and, um, and we were walking in the woods and we came upon these two people who sort of look like Proud Boys. Now, I have no idea whether they were Proud Boys or not, but, uh, but we're sitting there and we're thinking while we're looking at Lake Johnson, are we safe or would these people do something to hurt us? The reality is safety creates a situation where we find what we have in common. Uh, Stevie Wonder has a, a great song called Knocks Me Off My Feet. And in this song, song, he has a lyric that says, I reach out for the part of me that lives in you. And when I find a part of me that lives in you, uh, then I am comforted by what we have in common. And then I am able to learn and be enriched by our differences. All right, um, real quickly, uh, uh, this is my son-in-law and my daughter. Um, and what this is about, it's about diversity and equity. Uh, Andrew grew up in Seattle. He's something of, uh, of a valiant. He's sort of a human barbiturate, but he's like a really nice guy, but he's entering into a family that's an African-American family. And he's having some difficult time making the adjustments to that. So uh, my family kidnapped me and took me to Atlanta to the Martin Luther King Center when I was at, um, at the National Park Service. And we're sitting in the auditorium and they're having a conversation about the civil rights movement and Emmett Till and the burning of the buses and about um, the burning of the church, about all of those horrible things that happened during the civil rights movement and Andrew is sitting there and he's terrified. He's the only white person in the auditorium and he's terrified. My family calls me rescue dad. And so I feel like I got to help Andrew. So I say, Andrew, you're doing all right. He's got kind of like a tear in his eye and I hug him and I say, Andrew, you didn't do this. You can't take responsibility for it. You can't allow it to happen. You have to get involved in ways to solve it. And so Andrew and I hug and I say, Andrew, are you feeling better? And he said, a little bit. Then my son walks up to Andrew and they know each other. They, they went to the same high school. And Nicholas says, Andrew, this shit we just saw is the kind of stuff makes you want to hit a white boy. And I'm going, damn, Nicholas, I just got him back straight. So here's the question I'm asking. Are conversations about diversity and inclusion toxic? Are they full of anger, fertility, frustration, anxiety, resentment, blame, guilt, confusion, conflict? Or are they aspirational? Are they joyous, courageous, exciting, compassionate, satisfying, enriching, educational, hopeful, trusting, and open? And I decided at that moment when Nicholas was angry and, and Andrew felt guilt and blame that I would never have another toxic conversation about diversity and difference, that the conversations I will have will all be aspirational conversations because that's how we become comfortable with each other. That's how we learn from each other. That's how we use diversity as an asset. Um, now, I know I'm gonna run out of time, but there are a couple of things I wanna share with you. One, this is the diagram that created the Race and Social Justice Initiative in 2002. This is actually the drawing that I did. You can see how primitive it is. I, you know, I, I took flip chart class, so I learned how to uh, draw those little people. So when I'm talking to the mayor, about what the problem is in Seattle, what we found out is our community engagement process is totally dominated by white adult homeowners. Those are the people who come to public meetings. They send information to government and you see it's green. And I call this the green people chart because if I call it the white people chart and they were white, they wouldn't show up. So at any rate, 
Uh, green people send information and money to government. Green people in government turn that information into money and programs and services that come out the other side. We got green partners um, that also help government they make decisions. But everybody, if everybody who's involved in the process of creating government programs and services is green, then they're going to create programs and services that attract green people. So what we know in the city of Raleigh, that there is this barrier and behind this barrier are poor people, immigrants, refugees, ethnic, cultural people, all of those people are behind the barrier. And what the people inside government are saying is we need to help those people assimilate in to the green culture when the green culture is the thing that's creating the problem for them in the first place, right? So the question becomes what's in that barrier who's behind that barrier, and how do we begin to create what's called uh, inclusionary participatory democracy where everybody is engaged in the design and the development of government programs and services. Behind the barrier, not just ethnic and cultural people, behind the 60% uh, of people who live in the city of Raleigh rent. They don't, they don't engage in public process. Ethnic and cultural people only engage in public process when they're angry or afraid. So if we looked at this as a recreation model, and, and, and what we know about parks and recreation is that it reflects the values of the people who create it. So that uh, for a long time, uh, the programs and services we created were about basketball and baseball and football and arts and crafts and all of those things that green people enjoy. But for some reason, we're seeing that there are people outside the barrier who are not engaged. We even found out in the city of Seattle that immigrants and refugees believe that community centers, that community centers were private clubs and did not think they could come. So a part of our challenge is how do we create a sense of inclusion without the dominant culture uh, uh, sort of imposing its will and its values on other people. So my son works for Nike. And, uh, and so you see down at the bottom of this graph, there are a bunch of black people down there. The Nike has 80% market share of black people who buy shoes. Nike finally realized in order for it to be successful, it needed to be an urban culture company not a sports equipment company, and that's what they have become. In order for you to work with these groups outside these barriers, you have to know those groups. You have to know their cultures, you have to know their values, you have to know what they value, you have to understand their child rearing practices. If you don't, you will only uh, want them to assimilate into being green. So uh, people have asked a lot about how come black people don't go to state and national parks. And by the way, it's very different for, for Hispanics. Hispanics go to state and national park, parks. The problem with Hispanics is that they don't play by the rules. Every campsite, state and natural, national campsite in America is created for a family of four. Hispanics go with about 12 people and they got guitars and they got soccer balls and the white people who go to national parks for respite uh, and rest are really pissed off at the Hispanic people who come because it's a familiar experience. It's, a, it's about bonding. Uh, Native Americans don't go, obviously, because they used to live there. And it's very difficult for them to go back to that space when they, it's not a recreational experience to go back home when that home was taken from you. But for Black people specifically, because people ask me this question a lot, uh, I began to study the concept of biophobia. Biophobia is fear of nature. Your fear of nature either comes from an actual experience you had, a vicarious experience you had, or something that you made out about nature. This is uniquely about Black people. So when I tried to say to people, this is why Black people don't go to state national parks, it goes all the way back to violent separation from their homeland in a place where they lived at one with nature and were brought here because of their understanding of nature. The Middle Passage, 
uh, uh, coming across the ocean, not knowing where you were gonna go, what you were gonna do, slavery and forced labor, brutal living conditions, uh, uh, destruction of culture and social sy systems, which is called severe bloodline disruption, rural racial violence, lynching, forced labor, Jim Crow, the transformation of oral stories about nature uh, from love of nature to fear of nature, that people coming from Africa had an affinity for nature based on their working at one with it. So then what happens when that, uh, when that conversation or when that dialect begins to say, uh, there's nothing good that goes on out there. The Great Northern Migration, urbanization, redlining, which is where poor people are forced to live in certain communities and therefore the recreation interests and needs that they, there is almost no nature in those urban communities. You're talking about Chicago and Cabrini Green and you're talking about New York and Harlem and you're talking about Washington DC and Anacostia and Atlanta and, Butter, and Buttermilk Bottom. The, the things that, that exist, the options that exist in those environments shape those people's socioeconomics and their indigenous social, cultural and their physical environment determine what their career and recreation interests are. Uh, development of urban interests and reductionism, that means what I do is what I see out in front of me every day, the emergence of black urban culture and that these things have manifested themselves in what seems to be indifference or elective lifestyle choices as it relates to nature. So here's another thing to realize. Every decision you make about your free time is based on what's called a calculation of return on investment. For the amount of time, energy, and money I have, what is the most I'm going to get out of this experience? It's a calculation of return on investment. I lived in Oakland, California for eight years, four hours from Yosemite, never got there because I didn't see any reason to go. It couldn't be that pretty. There are not gonna be a whole lot of black people there. You gotta drive four hours through the armpit of California. It's Saturday and Beyonce's coming to town or I can drive to Yosemite. I'm gonna make a calculation of return on investment. And one of the things that parks and recreation people and conservationists need to think about is how ethnicity, culture, and class affect that calculation of return on investment. All right, I'm going to shift to what is normal. I do this exercise in my class every semester called a potato salad exercise because I think I make normal potato salad. The potato salad I make, make is good. When I go to people's houses, I take my potato salad because my potato salad is better than your potato salad. I make normal potato salad. So in class, I have everybody write down the ingredients that they have in normal potato salad. Uh, the most number of ingredients we've ever had was 73. And then I facilitate a process where we're gonna make normal potato salad. So we're gonna go through each of the 73 ingredients. And if everybody has to agree on every ingredient because if they don't agree, it's not normal. So at the time that we had 73 ingredients, we start with Miracle Whip, which everybody boos about. And of course, in North Carolina, they got that Duke's mayonnaise thing going on. We go through the list and more often than not, we end up with no ingredients because nobody can agree on what's normal. So what is normal? This is normal in American society. This is not normal. This is who you are. This is, this is your ecosystem. This is your cultural group. This is what's normal about American society and that there is no normal. So our question is, how do we prepare people to live powerfully in a society that is as complex as this society? How do we get people to see us as, as an asset? How do we get people to feel enriched by it? How do we get people to not sort themselves into these exclusive cadres so that they're comfortable with the people they're being with, but they're not learning or growing like they should? So uh, is there any such thing as normal? 
Um, normal is an illusion. What is normal to the spider is chaos for the fly. We can't use our values to motivate people whose culture, lifestyles, and choices emerge from a different uh, lifestyle than ours. And I realize I got about five minutes. We have to have a clear understanding of those cultures and we have to understand how they experience us and what relevance we have in their world. We cannot invite them to be green. When I left the National Park Service, I, was, I had a week left and the Secretary of Interior and John Jarvis called me up uh, to their offices and said, Mickey, how come our diversity stuff isn't working? And I said, there are two reasons. One is y'all seem to think that people of color really wanna be white people and you keep creating programs and services and giving them opportunities to become white people. The other is that if we don't sp spend a bunch of time breaking cycles of racism and poverty that create the reductionism that keep people from making a calculation of return on investment, we don't break cycles of racism and poverty. This is never gonna change. And the secretary says to me, the Department of Interior's responsibility is to manage 25% of the land mass of the United States, 20% of the land mass of the United States. Uh, it's not our job to break cycles of racism and poverty. But because we won't get involved in what it's gonna to take to break, break those cycles of racism and poverty and to get people engaged in new and different activities, the system continues to replicate itself. They're asking me, what can we do to get people of color to national parks in 1970? And they're asking that very same question today. Now I want to share with you the, um, the green people slide was one of the ideas that created the Race and Social Justice Initiative in Seattle. Uh, oh, this was okay, this I is, to it as a ignore. <laughs> yeah, I, it. It, I, uh, I don't. Integration in American society uh, was governed by three things. One, let's just listen to this for a minute. People immigrated to America. Uh, they came looking for, for what's in America and everybody was welcome to come. The, the whole idea of immigration to live in a free society and people are free to come. But uh, in coming, you can't bring with you your own polity. So if you've lived in a place that's royalty, if you've lived in a place that's a, that's a dictatorship, whatever that is, you can't bring your own political system to America. You have to come to America and you have to participate in the political system that's here. The third was that the full price of being an American citizen did not require you uh, to give up your your culture, uh, those cultural accoutrements that are important to you. You don't have to give up your language. You don't have to give up your dance. You don't have to give up your art. You can maintain those things. As a matter of fact, we want to encourage you to maintain those things because that's one of the things that's instructional about diversity, that we get to be in a multicultural society and those cultures are, um, are an asset that's full of possibilities for enrichment and growth. So those were the three things um, that sort of, uh, not dictated, but were present in the context of us thinking about immigration. Now, but the unfortunate thing is that we have people in this country who did not immigrate to this country. So we have blacks who were enslaved, we have Native Americans, uh, indigenous populations that were already here uh, that had their own cultures. Uh, and then uh, we did have immigrant populations coming from other places that are not necessarily immigrants, but refugees. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide because that goes on a while. What that chart was basically showing was that when immigration be became people of color. So in 19. Oh, God. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop and I'm going to stop the presentation and get back to you guys because I, I I think I can I think I can talk about this. All right. So so the deal is when we look at immigration in American society, when it became people of color, um, they stopped moving up. It used to be that when the Jews came, they would be the poorest people and they would move up, and the Italians would move up, and everybody else would move up. But the reality is when immigration became uh, uh, of color, that stopped happening. And so what we look at, um, I'm gonna, I, I just need to share this screen a minute, which means I need to go back and, 
and do the share screen thing again. Where am I? All right. Oh, here. Here I am. What I want to do is to share this with you. Um, these are, there was a, a report called the Kerner Report that was done in 1966 after the Watts riot. And the Kerner Report said the riot- Your, occurred, your screen didn't share. Huh? Your screen did not share. It didn't share? Okay, well, well just listen to this, okay? Um, you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So, so the things that were uh, uh, wrong with American society, and the current report said, is that it's based on institutionalized racism, and these are the problems we have to solve: high unemployment, low educational attainment, high dropout rates, underemployment, low expectations, low incomes, and poverty, neglect, psychic residue, which is physical evidence of bad decisions. Poor environmental conditions, health problems, no home ownership, family instability, high rates of delinquency, substandard housing, displacement, unresponsive government service, learned helplessness, and resignation to victimization were the things that created the Watts riots in 1965. These are the, exactly the same problems we have in East Raleigh now. And Time Magazine did a cutter, cover when Freddie Gray was killed in Baltimore taking their 1968 issue, crossing off 1968, I mean, uh, crossing off 1968 and putting 2015 because nothing has changed. And so the question we have to answer is why is it that nothing has changed? So I know we're at one o'clock and uh, I probably should have left a little time for people. And if you want, I'm, I've got time. So if you want to stay on, and there are questions you want to ask me. Obviously, there's a whole lot more to talk about, but I just wanted to share with you some things that might appear to be disparate that are just absolutely connected. And if we don't work on all these things together, we got a problem. A major problem is being able to see the relationship of conservation to environmental justice. A huge problem we have in American society is we're not seeing the relationship between conservation and environmental justice. Environmental justice and conservation people won't even talk to each other. Conservation people believe the environmental justice people don't have any vision of what's really wrong with the planet, right? Environmental justice people believe the conservation people are like Republicans. They don't care that in my lifestyle and in, 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 that in my zip code, uh, uh, people have a lifespan that's 13 years less. They don't care about that. But if we don't put those things together, when the environmental justice movement and the conservation movement come together, it will be as powerful as the post Martin Luther King civil rights stuff where they passed the Voting Rights Act and they passed the Civil Rights Act and we got CETA and model cities and a bunch of things that were designed to decrease the wealth gap. But uh, for some reason, we're not working on those things. Okay, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Does, well, go ahead, Ian. I know, well, I was just gonna say thank you, Mickey. That was an exceptional presentation, honestly. I mean, um, I, I knew some of it myself, but in general, I learned a lot from this and I know uh, uh, most of us also learned a lot as well. So um, I'm just gonna, finish the official recording part of this and then we can stay on and, and have more of a discussion. Um, yeah, if anybody has questions, I, I can stay on for, for, for a little bit. Okay, um, right. but for those of you who are here, thank you for coming. We have our uh, next Race in Place Seminar Series event on the 22nd of March at 12 p.m. with Dr. Jennifer Richmond Bryant. Thank you.